World Economic Forum 2019 continues to remain our top focus. And today, former RBI Governor Raghuram Rajan said he feels that a scientific process should be put in place to decide how much dividend the Reserve Bank of India should be paying the government. Speaking exclusively to Shireen Bhan on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum, Rajan also clarified that the government did not reject his suggestions on accounting for capital, but wanted to learn more. Here's a slice of that conversation. I'm not sure that there was a formula. Uh, it, there was a process by which we uh, account for capital, which was actually one of the most modern processes, uh, looking at value at risk and how much could be afforded, and, and what we could therefore transfer to the government. Uh, and I think this is something other central banks have picked up. Um, we were asked to make presentations elsewhere. It is something that offers a basis for discussion going forward, mm. and it's something we should think about. So what was it that you suggested to the government and what, what was the response that you got from the government on this? No, I, I, I think the, uh, what we had suggested is we need a scientific process by which we evaluate how much capital the, the RBI needs and based on that we declare a dividend rather than negotiate this every year around budget time, how much do you need, how much can we spare, etc, yeah. etc. Yeah. Let's do it on a basis. Do you believe that that process is arbitrary somewhat? Well, by its very nature, it's arbitrary because it's based on what, uh, you know, the needs of the government are rather than what uh, the RBI needs in terms of maintaining its balance sheet strength and so on. So I would start first by saying here is how much the RBI needs to present a picture of health because we need a strong central bank. And then anything that is excess should be paid over to the government. It is the government's. The RBI has no call to keep anything that is over and above that. The magic question of course is what is that, that number yeah. what is that number and for that having an objective process of deciding how much that is that is what mr gandhi was probably referring to we had a team within the rbi do the uh, the calculations prepare the structure uh, this splendid young team which uh, which essentially read the latest literature and put it together and the question is is that the basis for proceeding forward it is state of the art in determining how much capital the rbi needs so was that taken forward at all in any form no, or fashion we, by the government in, in your conversations with I them? Think, I think we had a discussion then. Uh, we put it on the table. The board uh, at that time approved it uh, um, uh, in a sense uh, of this is a basis for discussion going forward. The government uh, at that point decided that they needed to learn more. So it wasn't that it was rejected. It was just that we never concluded on that. So given the work that you did uh, in the past and the fact that there is this committee that's looking at this issue, what should be the guiding parameters? Well, it's up to the committee to figure it out. No, but what uh, would you suggest? I no, mean, what, what was I, I it that you put on the table? I think the committee will think very carefully about this. And I think the two or three big issues that, that uh, it will consider first are that what is the appropriate level for the RBI to maintain a strong healthy balance sheet especially when it looks uh, w when it's outward facing towards the rest of the world the second issue is okay once you've decided this is a quantum that is excess how do we actually pay it out mm. because there's an accounting issue in whether you can pay out things that are not generated through profits mm. but that are generated through for example foreign exchange depreciation and that accounting issue has to be dealt with because uh, that is a constraint and the third issue is uh, how do you pay it out without monetizing mm. uh, a large part uh, uh, which which you cannot really afford to given the liquidity conditions in the economy mm. all three have to be thought of my sense is that uh, you know previous people have opined the best way to actually pay out a large dividend to the government is to write off the bonds that you hold on your balance sheet mm. of the governments. So the government's debt comes down mm. and you don't monetize the process. That's something to think about, but that's more me speaking with my academic <laughs> hat. Well, uh, let me continue to get you to speak using your academic hat. Uh, Irene Subramaniam uh, had said that you deferred with him on the use of the capital reserves. His idea in the economic survey that he put forward was, uh, was sort of a public asset rehabilitation agency or recapitalization of banks using the 4 lakh crore rupees, which he believes was excess capital. You deferred with him on both these. Why? Well, uh, the, uh, what, uh, the public um, asset reconstruction agency, what, what people call the bad bank, my worry is, was that that bad bank would be manned by government 
uh, or public sector officials. And so you won't solve any problem in terms of reducing the bad loans because it would go from the pocket of the public sector banks into the pocket of the uh, public sector reconstruction corporation. Uh, why would they have any stronger incentives to deal with the bad loans uh, than before? So it seemed to me that this was just changing from one pocket to another, something we do often in the government in <laughs> India today uh, and, and in the past, and it's something that I don't think changes very much mm -hmm. on the ground. Um, the, on recapitalization? On recapitalization, it, it led to the uh, very issue that we were just talking about. Uh, if the banks are granted this money, will they spend it? Will it lead to monetization? Mm -hmm. And he had some scheme for trying to ensure that it actually wasn't spent. To my mind, all these clever schemes can be short-circuited by simply saying, government, we owe you money, mm -hmm. we have some of your bonds, we'll write off those bonds. And so your debt level, the government's debt level would come down. Now you figure out how much you need to borrow in the ordinary scheme of things. Mm. It also is the right thing to do because remember these surpluses have been built up over many years. Yes. It is what essentially belongs to governments over the years. Yes. And to that extent, by writing down the debt, you will create the conditions for this government to move on with, uh, you know, based on what it should have inherited from past governments. Mm. So if it needs to borrow more, it should borrow more, but that should be explicit and identified and as additional government borrowing. The partial shutdown of the U.S. government has not impacted Infosys' American business so far. That is the word coming in from Salil Parik, the CEO and Managing Director of Infosys. In an exclusive interaction with CNBC, Parikh also remained positive about their India business. He said that reforms like the GST, implemented by the Modi government, have aided the sustainable growth that India has witnessed over the last few years. So far, we've actually not seen any impact on our business. Mm. About 60% of our business comes from the U.S. Mm. And we've had good growth. We announced our results just a few days ago for the last quarter. A strong growth in the U.S., strong growth in financial services across all of the sectors. Mm. Of course, the work that's going on within the U.S. and the concern with the slowdown, with the shutdown, will result in some impact downstream if it's not addressed at one stage. And I, perhaps the concern is it's coming at a time where it's late stage growth in the United States. People are worried that perhaps there won't be an infrastructure plan because of the stalemate in Washington. As it pertains to your business going forward, are you already seeing any waning confidence from U.S. corporates, any dip in demand for your business services? You know, again, we, we've not seen any dip in demand. Yeah. Of course, this has been a long growth cycle. Uh, with the shutdown and with some other activities globally, mm -hmm. there's some concern that this could start to slow down. There's talk about it, but in real demand terms, there's no real impact. Is that true globally for your business as well? Also, so our European business actually grew faster than our U.S. business in the last quarter, and that's going well. Uh, Asia-Pacific for, uh, for us, mainly Australia and Japan, that also grew nicely. Okay. So all of those at this stage seem to be okay. Yeah, we were talking about this PwC survey about pessimism out there, right. talking about the IMF downgrades. Do you think there is a disconnect between the real fundamentals there and the sentiment? It's difficult to say because in, in many ways, the view is because it's gone on for mm. so long, the expansion, it should come to some slowing. Yeah. But when you talk to people, and especially on digital investments, we still see massive growth. We had... 30% growth in digital. Mm -hmm. And so that's not something that's going to quickly disappear to zero uh, in the coming years. Tell me a bit more about what's happening in your home market, because also a part of that PwC survey, they really mentioned that India was seen as a rising star for global companies looking for investment outside of their own countries. Have you been encouraged by the developments there? Any reason to be worried about a pairback in reforms as we get closer to elections? Well, I think the, the good news with the domestic market in India is the growth's been sustained over the last several years. Mm -hmm. And at 7.4 to 7.8 percent, that's a strong growth on a fairly large economy now. Mm -hmm. uh, the changes that are being put in place are all starting to support the growth, especially the GST, the goods and services tax we've right. had. Of course, the elections uh, uh, in the near future but we don't see any change in the way the government is approaching business. Mm -hmm. If anything, there'll be more focus on making sure the business grows. And with the elections quickly done, I think the growth will continue on. 
All right, more big voices coming in from Davos. Chairman of JSW Group, Sajjan Jindal, said the company would expand its capacity to 40 million tons by 2025. Speaking exclusively to Shreen Bhan on the sidelines of the Davos World Economic Summit, Jindal sought safeguard duties on steel imported from countries where free trade agreement, namely Japan and Korea. When asked about the insolvency process, Jindal said he does not see any attractive steel asset to buy at this point of time. The Indian steel industry has also been asking for protection. We've seen measures being taken, but more uh, is the demand of Indian steel makers. What exactly are you looking for? You know, the problem with steel industry is that the product, the, the, the material can flow in, in any direction because the cost of uh, transportation is minimal. Uh, therefore, uh, every country in the world, if you see, look at United States or uh, look at Europe or European Union, look at Japan, Korea, China, Brazil, every country tries to protect their own home market because uh, steel is very strategic to the, to the country because uh, you cannot rely on imported steel uh, for, for everything. You need to produce your own steel and India is a large country. Uh, so therefore, uh, you know, we, we uh, as an industry, we always want uh, that our industry must, there should be a fair competition. Mm. Their uh, imports are coming, for example, today, uh, Japan and Korea, they don't allow any imports. They have non-tariff barriers, huge amount of non-tariff barriers. But uh, we have uh, 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 FTA with Japan mm. and Korea. And a lot so you of want safeguard duties on countries where we have an FTA? FTA, because uh, a lot of steel comes from uh, Japan and Korea into India at 0% duty, mm. so which is not fair to the Indian steel industry. What yeah. kind of expansion plans have you lined up? For example, our steel business is today 18 million tons. We have uh, two plants coming up. Uh, each of 5 million tons. Uh, first one will get completed by uh, in the next fiscal and the next one will get uh, over in the next uh, year after the fiscal. So therefore we will have 10 million tons uh, coming up plus so we have uh, some inorganic uh, growth uh, through the IBC process mm. where we are participating in acquiring some assets. So therefore we are looking that by 2025 we should be uh, organically we should get to a 40 million ton capacity in steel and inorganically if we add up maybe close to 50 million tons mm -hmm. which is a significant capacity. Mm -hmm. You know you talked about the IBC process and one matter is subjudice, uh, uh, the other is also subjudice mm -hmm. but of course uh, uh, we don't know what the outcome will be. This battle for SR steel, uh, you know what, what's your take take on how that's going to play out? No it's, it's a, I mean SR steel is a big steel company at about 10 million ton nearly uh, so, so it's a, it's a very significant uh, play, and um, uh, ArcelorMittal is very seriously looking at it. I mean, at the moment, they are the highest bidder, and they are most likely to to uh, get to the uh, the the victory line. Um, but, but uh, you know, the, there's a lot of. Why did uh, you decide to throw your hat into the ring? We haven't. We haven't. I mean, uh, it's uh, we 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 were uh, at one time we were looking at uh, Bhushan Steel very keenly, and therefore we did not participate in SR because we thought that Bhushan Steel was a better asset, which we lost to Tata Steel, and uh, so uh, thereafter we started becoming a little more interested in SR to look at whether there was a way to consolidate that industry, uh, because Tata Steel is consolidating in the east, and yeah. whether we could consolidate in the west. Uh, so, so that's the idea. I mean, we, I'm not sure whether we, I will be able to do that, but uh, because ArcelorMittal uh, is is there with the highest bidder, but because of uh, various litigations, let's see what happens. Mm. Uh, we, any other specific stressed assets that you would be interested in across uh, across these sectors? I mean, uh, in steel, uh, we don't see any um, any more uh, st assets left because their others are all very small and um, you know don't form the don't have the critical mass for us to to mm. take interest. We have, as I said, uh, big big plans to go organically, grow organically. So therefore, we are not looking at uh, other than uh, Bhushan Power and Steel and mm. SR Steel. Mm. The Income Tax Department has held a meeting with tax professionals after a row over TDS notices. Reports had suggested that the taxman had sent notices to businesses over delays in TDS deposits on a very large scale. However, the department had refuted these reports and today the key income tax officials met representatives from organizations of tax professionals to discuss the key concerns. Prashant, who has been tracking that meeting, joins in with the latest. Prashant, uh, what was discussed during the meeting today? Uh, you know, just to uh, go back a little bit, what was the big hue and cry about? The hue and cry uh, uh, was essentially that uh, prosecution notices were being sent out 
uh, to small businesses, large businesses, uh, because a tedious a tax deducted at source which was being collected uh, from employees was not being deposited with the government. Uh, you know, there is no specified time within which you have to do that. Uh, but the delay meant that uh, businesses, I mean, actually not just in Mumbai, we're talking about Mumbai because, I mean, it is such an important tax source uh, and, and uh, high profile in that sense. But this has been happening and we've been getting reports from around the country that lacks of notices had been, have been sent out. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was the basic issue. The tax department, uh, the, uh, the tax department in Mumbai actually called uh, a, a meeting of uh, professional C uh, chartered accountant uh, bodies uh, and that meeting actually was held today. So, I mean, who attended? There was uh, the prin uh, principal commissioner of income tax Mumbai. There was the chief commissioner of income tax. And there were a few other uh, sort of, uh, you know, top, top tax officials uh, who sat across the table. And on the other side, uh, you know, there were there was uh, representatives from the Bombay CA Society, Chambers of Tax Consultants, uh, All India Federation of Tax pra Practitioners, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. What came out essentially after, uh, and, and uh, I spoke to people who attended the meeting and they said, well, the meeting was about all kinds of uh, issues with regards to the tax department. It, it, and it was not just about TDS, uh, but uh, a majority of the time was spent discussing these t uh, prosecution notices with regards to TDS. Uh, and uh, by the end of it, the tax department essentially uh, told, the, uh, uh, told the people attending that, uh, why don't all of you form a committee uh, within one week come up with suggestions uh, and uh, you know we uh, and then we meet again and we kind of sort of formulate a plan in terms of how to tackle this because the communication which came out of the tax department is that, was that well while we intend to uh, press the law fully uh, our intention is not to harass uh, citizens harass uh, honest uh, uh, tax paying businesses small or uh, large in any uh, uh, in any manner we've already seen i mean the cbdt in delhi yesterday issued some numbers in terms of uh, you know a couple of thousand uh, notices being sent out uh, sent out as against uh, some 6 crore returns which are filed so i mean the tax department both in delhi and bombay are also sort of putting forth their uh, view uh, that maybe uh, you know, this is being blown out of proportion. Their intention is not to uh, harass uh, citizens with these notices. But nevertheless, I mean, when you make calls, you talk to people in the profession, there is a sense uh, that uh, the tax department is being overzealous. Uh, and, and of course, the aim, we all know, is very clear, revenue mop-up. We'll see how this goes. But for uh, starters today, uh, we had a, we've had a meeting and uh, this uh, will be taken forward uh, in the, by that committee. Back to you. All right, Prashant, thank you very much for joining in with that. And we'll have him back with more details as this story develops. Now, here's the CNBC TV 18 exclusive then. We learn from sources that Paytm Mall has started operations in late 2016 and since then has seen sales decline by $200 million in 2018 and its market share also fall by half. And that's not all. We also learn that sellers have now alleged that the company has asked them to ship stocks directly to the customers and not to the Paytm Mall's warehouse. Mukta Varya is here with the latest details. Mukta, you have been talking to your sources amongst the sellers. What are the issues that are being raised? Yes, Paytm Mall, the e-commerce arm of the parent company of Paytm, has seen sales drop and has also lost credible market share among e-commerce companies. Now, as per exclusive data from Forrester Research, Paytm Mall's market share dipped to about 3% in 2018 from 5.6% in 2017. Now, industry sources say that Paytm Mall also saw total sales drop in 2018 to about 800 million from over a billion in 2017. Now remember, this comes even as the company has been offering a lot of cashbacks on its platform, which saw its losses increase to about 1700 crore in FY18 on total revenues of rupees 700 crore. Now some sellers I spoke to say that they have raised concerns of falling sales on Paytm Mall over the last few days, especially because the company has told them to not ship their stock to the warehouses, but to fulfill the orders directly to the customers. This sellers say is indicative of falling orders. Now Paytm All right, uh, we'll have Mugta back uh, with more details in some time from now, but we're completely timed out. So we'll wrap up this edition of Reporters Diary. Thank you very much for watching, but do stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. Coming up next, we head back to Davos for the most comprehensive coverage of the World Economic Forum. The biggest industry voices and policymakers speak exclusively to CNBC TV 18. Stay tuned for that.